and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel. My name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn Booksellers, which is an independent bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we are very pleased to be speaking tonight with a local author, Jeff Zuckerman. Um, we're going to be talking about his book, Unglued, A Bipolar Love Story, um, which was a finalist in the memoir and creative nonfiction category for the Minnesota Book Award. So congratulations on that, Jeff. And very pleased that Jeff's going to be in conversation tonight with Dr. Joe Gredler. So we're going to hear uh, some portions from the book. They're going to have a conversation. And if you are watching along with us, please feel free to ask questions. Towards the end of the hour, we will uh, have a chance for you to ask some questions of Jeff and Joe and um, you can do that at any point during the broadcast, however, because if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can just put your questions or comments in the chat or comment functions. Let us know where you're watching from, say hello, but also just know that if at any point you have questions, you can put them in there, we'll see them. I will also be putting a link to Unglued in the comments. Um, it'll take you to the Majors and Quinn website. We have copies of the book on the shelves. If you happen to be watching from the Twin Cities area, Majors and Quinn is open every day, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. So you can swing by and pick up a copy in person, or you can just use our website. We have uh, shipping and next day pickup options, whatever you prefer. Thank you so much for your support of our virtual events program and local authors like Jeff. Really happy to have you here. So I'm just gonna introduce these two wonderful speakers and then we'll get on with the show. Jeff Zuckerman is a Minneapolis freelance editor and writer, former social worker, an award-winning newspaper reporter, editor, and university writing instructor at the U of M. He was for many years, the director of the Writing Center at Walden University. For the last several years, he has co-facilitated a monthly NAMI support group, which is National Association for Mental Illness Support Group in South Minneapolis for spouses and partners of those with a mental illness. And I should mention that uh, the reason this event is happening this week, uh, also, you know, exciting that he was a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award, but um, it is Mental Health Awareness Month. So that's very uh, appropriate for this topic. And thanks also to Dr. Joe Gredler for being here. Dr. Joe Gredler is a dissertation editor and graduate writing uh, in part of the graduate writing faculty at Walden University. He has also edited parenting books at Meadowbrook Press and taught composition and literature courses at the University of Minnesota. When he's not busy with his daughters, he likes to read fiction and take bike rides. That's lovely. Thank you both for being here, Jeff and Joe, um, and uh, I will see you at the end of the broadcast. I'm so looking forward to this. Thank you, Annie, for that gracious introduction. We appreciate that. So Jeff, tonight, let's focus on two main topics, mental illness and the writing process. What inspired you to write a book that focuses on a spouse's experiences with a loved one's late onset mental illness? Um, and by the way, Joe, thank you so much for doing this with me. It means a lot to me. Um, so during Leah's um, first manic episode, I was 60 years old. Uh, I was couch surfing. I was living some nights in a tent, uh, and I and I was asking myself, you know, amidst all of her this unexpected unex late onset undiagnosed manic episode, what happened to my life and what happened to my wife? Um, at that time, as I was getting more acquainted with mental illness, I read some pretty good memoirs. Um, a lot of them written by people with a mental illness, um, very few, very, very few written by even if any family member um, I, of somebody with a mental illness. Um, I read a really good, it's sort of like a how-to manual called Loving Someone with Bipolar Disorder um, by Julie Fast and um, John Preston. I think I might have even bought it at uh, Borders. Um, and that's a really good how-to manual, but there wasn't anything that really got at the experience the way a memoir does the book that I was looking for. There's one written by a guy named Mark Lukacs. It was a bestseller. It's called My Lovely Wife and the Psych Ward. I read that. And that's the closest that I came. But he wrote about his lovely wife a lot more than he wrote about himself. 
I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, well, okay, your, your wife's having a really hard time. What's going on in your head? How are you dealing with this? So I wrote the book that I wish I could have read during the beginning of uh, Leah's late onset bipolar disorder. So you describe this as a book about you rather than your wife. Is that accurate? Some people might say, well, she's the one with the mental illness. Why isn't she the focus of the book? Uh, well, it's, you know, it's impossible to write this book without explaining what she went through. Um, and I, I couldn't write the book and it was, you know, I can't write the book about my wife's experience. Um, so the focus really is on me and what's going on in my head and what I'm experiencing. Um, in fact, there's a number of places where I wrote, I, I'm pretty sure that I wrote, Leah might have a different interpretation of this. Um, she might have a different perspective or even a different memory. Um, and I said, she'd be welcome to write that book. I will say those books have been written um, and they're really good. Uh, um, there's one by a Minneapolis author. <laughs> it seems like so many of the authors in this subject are, are from Minneapolis. Um, the one I would recommend is by Mara Hornbacher. Um, it's called Madness. Um, she wrote a book about her experience her own experience of uh, mental illness. Um, a weird thing in this was that her, that her husband's name in the book was Jeff. So I'm reading this book about what she's going through. And again, I said, whoa, I want to hear Jeff's story. Um, so here it is. I, I hope that answers the question. It does. How did Leah feel about you writing this book and did her attitude change over time as you were writing? She was, I don't know how, she wasn't really involved in the beginning when I first started writing it. I think I told her, I, I think she knew I was, I was trying to write a book. Um, early on, I, I'm pretty sure that she read three complete drafts. She, um, by training and by education, was a an editor um, uh, as part of her jobs um, with a journalism degree. And I got to tell you, she's a terrific proofreader, and she would find stuff that I just missed. And she had the patience to read um, th uh, three drafts, uh, and, and it was terrific. Her feedback was terrific. It was more at a line a line level. And I remember, I'm pretty sure there were three things that I had written in an earlier draft that she asked me, or she told me, but she asked me to take out. There were three personal things that she didn't want in there, but that's out of an entire book. It was, there were three things. Uh, and, and I'll add that even since it's been published, she's been pushing me to do readings like this and to do speaking engagements and just has been amazingly supportive. Um, I, I, for that reason, among others, among many reasons, I say that she's the most courageous person I know. And one of my friends in Colorado said, Jeff, you're, the, you're such a courageous guy for putting this out there. And others have said that. Well, my wife Leah is an extraordinarily courageous uh, person and a terrific reader. And so I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. You're quite graphic about the extreme highs of Leah's mania and the lows of her depression in the book. Were you concerned about further stigmatizing her mental illness with those graphic descriptions? <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. Um, I think anybody writing a can't, Anybody writing a candid memoir about anything probably has some fear of how much am I telling? Is it appropriate for me to tell all this? Uh, is there a boundary that I'm breaking through my candor? I suspect that anybody who writes about someone else's mental illness, and to a lesser extent, I'm pretty open. I'm pretty candid. 
um, about what I went through. Um, well, this being um, National um, Mental Health Awareness Month, I want to emphasize that I think it's so important for us to be candid with each other because a big part of the problem is that people don't open up about their mental health or their mental illness. And from my perspective, so many people don't talk about what's going on in their lives with the ones they love. And I'll add, or friends, um, they're, we, we hide it. We hide behind the stigma and we hide behind our secrecy and it's so destructive. And I got to tell you, yesterday, um, I have been saying there was CDC, um, CDC data in January that 40% of adult Americans uh, were experiencing some level of uh, anxiety or depression, in part, in large part, because of the related to the pandemic. In the past, the number has always been 20%. So twice as many people now are experiencing that. And then yesterday, there was a, a show at noon on Minnesota Public Radio, and they said 80 percent, 80% of Americans' mental health has been affected by the pandemic. And I'm, I don't know where they got that number from, but whatever, it's a lot. So, yes, I think it's really important to have can, a candid conversation, a candid book about just what how, what it is to go through with severe um, mental illness or even depression and anxiety, other ones that aren't so severe. I got to add that um, in terms of my fear about what I was writing, readers have told me that my empathy and my love overshadowed the stigma and and overshadowed the the honesty, the candor that I described, the mania and the depression. Um, I learned so much about mental illness along the way, which I described in the book, and certainly that it's a medical illness. It's a medical illness that can be managed with the help of doctors. And I think that helped redu and the way I explain that and go through our experience, I think that helped um, reduce the, um, the, the stigma of what, of what I had written. Last thing I'll say about this, I tried to be funny and I think if, you know, and I, and it was really self-deprecating, it was self-deprecating, but I was also really hard on myself and how I handled it. So anything that I said, you know, I'm, 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 not always a shining hero in this, but I put that out there too because that's part of the that's part of the deal. In a recent Star Tribune piece, you wrote that coming out to your neighbors was a turning point for you. Why was it so important to talk with people about what you were going through? Yeah, that's related. That's that's about the stigma. Oh, by the way, I want to add something about that. You know, thank you for cutting me off. <laughs> kind of like when people talk too much during these. I got to tell you that um, it was candid, but I uh, I drew the line on some really weird incidents in the psych ward um, where I there wasn't a real there wasn't a real good reason to. And I mean, I, I I wrote about the psych ward from an you know from an from a visitor's perspective. Um, but that stigmatizing thing, you got me thinking that um, there's, there's, there, there was no reason to con merely confirm people's preconceptions about mental illness and about a, and about a um, psych ward. And at some point, it just felt mean. And I really tried to make sure the book wasn't mean. So I just want to follow. I just want to make sure I said that. Uh, you asked, well, go ahead, ask that question again about the Star Tribune. Well, you mentioned in that Star Tribune piece that 
coming out to your neighbors was a big deal for you? Why did you feel the need to talk with people about what you were going through? And if anybody isn't aware, I, the Star Tribune um, published a commentary piece for me a week ago, Sunday, um, uh, in a Sunday paper, and it was about um, it was about the importance of people who are going through a family member or loved one's mental illness to talk to each other. It's not just about the uh, the person with the illness. It's not just about their experience, but we all need to be talking um, with um, about it. Um, so yeah, in there, I mentioned that talking to my next door neighbor, you know, it, it, Joe you used the, the phrase coming out. And it, it, it was like coming out when I talked to my uh, neighbors that day. And I want to I'm only going to read three short things tonight. And this is one that I want to read. And it relates to that question that I referred to about my neighbors. The stigma of mental illness was pestering me. Uh, if your neighbor slips on the ice and bangs his head on the ground and ends up with a traumatic brain injury, you bring over the tuna casserole. Who's not willing to walk another neighbor's dog when she's getting treated for back surgery? Who judges the fellow with Lou Gehrig's disease? The woman with Parkinson's. Well, I was done playing charades. I started with my next door neighbors, Barb and Hal. They're a little older than Leah and I, like us, with grown kids out of the house. Barb, a native Iowan, sweet natured and calm. Hal can be as gruff as bark on an ash tree, but he has a warm, funny side when he's in a good mood every few months. So here's the deal I told them over coffee at their dining room table. Yeah, I may have noticed things have been a little weird over at our house lately. Well, yeah, Barb said, we've been hearing some stuff. We kind of wondered. The thing is, I blubbered, Leah's been diagnosed with a mental illness. She's got the bipolar disorder. Cripes, I could barely even say it out loud. I'd spent the summer so royally barbecued by public emotions packed away so deeply that as I sat in my longtime neighbor's house and cracked my heart open a bit, the tears started again. Just shut up, Jeff, and shovel your walk in the winter and grow your raspberries every summer and share them with the neighbors. Don't bring down these people with your mess of a life. Good neighbors don't do that. Well, Barb said, you know, our Sam's got that too. When he was in high school, their son Sam is in his late 30s now. Oh, man, Hal laughed. You never heard those fights we had? He's been dealing with it, Barb said. Sam, he can get so depressed. I don't think he's been manic for a while, but it absolutely sucks, Hal said. I'm really sorry to hear that. But Sam has gotten better, they assured me. Wait, so he's gotten better? Even if Sam hadn't improved, I was glad they said he had. I needed hope. And that's how it went as I spilled the truth to my neighbors. Everyone knew somebody was something or other. Everyone felt bad for me, especially bad for Leah. Everyone cared about us both. Everyone asked what they could do to help. It's hard to explain just how listening to my story with grace and without judgment was exactly the help that I needed. Wow, what an excellent passage. Thanks for that, Jeff. Uh, how about family members? What advice could you offer about talking to immediate and extended family members about a mental illness? Uh, for the most part, we've been lucky. Uh, for one thing, for one thing, my family and extended family had known Leah for so for 30 years. So so they knew it wasn't the real her. Um, it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't, it, it wasn't Leah. Um, some of my family, extended family, had firsthand uh, knowledge of mental illness. Um, as did our friends, and and like I said, I was so relieved that that my neighbors got it. Um, in the beginning, um, before her mania, 
I mean, before her diagnosis, um, it was really hard when there was so much anger and she was telling everybody what an asshole I am. Uh, it was before the diagnosis and she was emailing a lot of people and stuff. Um, that's really hard. Um, I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll add that it's common for a lot of people. And now I've learned a lot in my support group. And, and this is what I've heard from support group. Um, it's common that people with a mental illness who go through a psychotic or manic episode might have a difficult task patching things up. But at the same time, it's made me a lot more empathetic to what the experience is. Um, now, also in my support group, I, ha I have heard some stories that are not like ours, uh, where family members don't get it, and they might even break apart because someone's got a mental illness, or they say she ought to just get up out of bed, or they say, why don't you just get divorced? Or they cut each other off and there's been hurtful things that happen. So um, I'm just, we're, we're lucky that way. Um, so what I'll say about family members is that's why it's Mental Health Awareness Month. The more we talk about it and the more we acknowledge just now, how come 40% of Americans with anxiety and depression? I mean, who out there right now has not gone through something um, over the last, you know, over the last year? Um, so there's education that needs to happen. People's hearts need to be opened up to it. Um, some aren't, which is really painful. Um, we we're lucky. People were, we were just lucky. One other thing I got to add, Joe, in answer to that question. This um, mental illness and how we deal with it and address it, I've learned varies culturally. Um, and so everything that I'm saying, I'm giving from a, um, <laughs> I got to say, a white guy, a white middle class guy perspective, an educated white middle class guy perspective. So that's a little bit caveat about how I answer this question. Well, that's a nice segue to the second half of our discussion tonight, Jeff. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about your writing process. What kind of book did you originally consider writing and how did that idea compare with what you actually wrote? So I went out to dinner with my friend Laura in South Minneapolis, in Linden Hills. I remember this. We went out and I told her, she's a book editor, and I said, I have this idea. And I'd been doing a lot of social science editing and reading. And I thought, why don't I interview 10 people, 10 spouses or partners like me, and put together a book about what spouses go through when, when they love someone with a mental illness? And Laura said, hey, great idea. Why don't you start by interviewing yourself? I said, whoa. So 120,000 words later, and I answered the questions I wanted to ask. It took me 120,000 words. So that's how it changed from sort of a, uh, almost like a sociological or something like that, a social science book into a memoir. And by the way, the the... <laughs> I could have written 6,000 pages. I had hundreds of pages of email and texts and um, email texts and journal entries. So my challenge was how to take all that. The original draft, I think, was 120,000 words. And with editing help, I got it down to about 80. I think the final draft came in at 83,000 words. Um, so that's, I, don't know, I guess that answers your question. Yeah, and it also anticipates my next question. Why did you include emails and text messages? Oh, oh actually, I knew you were going to ask that because my friend Joe Gredler said um, said uh, that, uh, why don't you include email and text and um, in journal? You didn't, you didn't say that, but you... 
you lauded me for doing it. And the reason that I did was if, if they felt appropriate, they, they told the story, um, they were pri- they were like primary documents um, that that told a story. The journal entries show right where my head was in real time, uh, and uh, I think they re- they they revealed something. They revealed something about the character. The text message and email re- revealed about Leah's state in mania and depression. Um, and also I, there were some where it was, I remember writing about her sweet side and I think that came through also in some of the email texts. Um, so I think, I, does that answer the question why I yeah, did? It, it does. It sounds like from the original social science conception of the book, you decided to include texts and emails as primary data samples. Right to augment your narrative, and that also aligned with the epistolary structure that we may have discussed early on, <laughs> well, tossing around I, some, yeah. some narrative terminology. <laughs> you, yeah, you and I discussed that after you explained to me what an epistolary narrative is. Um, one of the tri- I, I'll say this though, and and um, anybody who's in anybody who's trying to write a memoir like this and thinking about using them, it's really easy to get carried away. Again, there were so many hundreds and hundreds of pages of primary documents and stuff to choose from. And then it became a, that's why I needed outside readers to help me figure out, well, this can go, this can go, this can go. It's easy to overdo that. And sometimes they end up just getting in the way because you know, they get in the way of the narrative. And I only wanted to write a 300 page book. Um, so, which is the same as social scientists who are collecting a mountain of data, and then you have to turn it into a 20 page journal article. So, Right. And here's a question I never get tired of asking because it's one of the my favorite aspects of your book. How would you describe your narrative voice? And did you have that voice from the beginning or did it take some time for your voice to emerge while you were writing? Well, I took a class at the loft in spring of 2018. It was a class actually on how you take uh, primary documents like that in, in, and build a narrative and use them to help build your narrative in any kind of creative nonfiction. Uh, And so I remember I was in that class and I was an experienced writer, an experienced editor. So in some ways I knew what I was doing. In some ways I didn't know what I was doing. I hadn't, I hadn't written any kind of, hadn't written a memoir before. Uh, So I remember in that class, I, the first draft was in second person and it was, just all over the place. And I'm sure it wasn't very good. Well, I'm taking a class at the loft and they're all, oh, Jeff, it's just so good. Well, you know, it really wasn't what it did. It got me going. And it and you have to do that to find your natural voice. And the natural voice that I have, that I think I did a pretty good, I, I'm a funny guy. Not everybody always agrees. I'm a funny guy. I wanted to write a funny book because who wants to read a a book about a miserable book about horrible things and misery? So I use, and and my natural voice is funny, and I like telling funny stories, and I like, you know, being a funny guy. So that all, that was the voice I tried to find. It's a voice I used to use when I was a newspaper guy and a columnist. And that was uh, 35 years ago, 30 years ago, and the fiction and nonfiction that I've written since then as a newspaper columnist and so on. And um, I've done stand up and that stuff. I, 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 re, I think I recap, it took, a, it took a lot of work, but I think I recaptured that. Um, some people thought it was a little snarky, and I think it was at times a little snarky, and editors pointed that out. A little too sarcastic, too sarcastic for my own uh, point of view. Joe, you thought my earlier drafts, you loved it. It encouraged, <laughs> encouraged the um, 
you know, sarcasm, snarkiness, or, you know, some of that stuff. I had to cut back on some of that. And I got good feedback from readers about where it went overboard. And I never, ever wanted to be mean. And that was helpful to get from other people, too. There's a fine line between mean and, you know, funny. Oh, one of our audience members asked a question that is timely. And I'd like to ask that to you now, if you wouldn't mind, Jeff. Was writing the book therapeutic for you, and did it help you understand what you went through? Uh, it's it's a ex, it's an excellent question that I'm often asked. What's what's therapeutic is Leah getting better, and my own ability to um, take care of myself and have a loving relationship with my with my wife the book has probably probably been more therapeutic to um other readers in ways than than i was writing it was at times just really really hard and i cried a lot and if i haven't read the book in a few months and i pick it up again i cry because it's powerful it's personal and reliving some of that stuff is pretty painful. Um, so I just remind myself as I'm reading it, and I'm always glad to say that it's got a pretty hopeful ending. So therapeutic, um, not in the way that you want to say, oh, I read this, wrote this book, and I end up feeling so much better for my, eh, if I'm going to be honest, not so much. I don't think, maybe I'm wrong. Did you experiment with different endings and why did you choose the ending that appears in the book? I did. Uh, well, Joe, the, the book, the book covers 2015 to 2005 years, the last year and a half go quite quickly. Um, Leah's health kept changing from the first draft on. Uh, when I had finished the whole draft, her, her health was one place. And so that was the ending. And it was at that point pretty unsatisfactory because she was in a pretty bad place when I finished that first draft. And I, it was important for me to end with some kind of hope. In, my, in our NAMI support groups, we always end our principles of support by saying we will never give up hope. And what good does it do if you don't have hope? So I had to figure out, how am I going to write a hopeful ending to, at one point I wrote, um, so few of these books have happy ending because they're rarely happy and they re rarely end well. And I was afraid that was going to be my ending. But I was so glad and it, it felt honest. And it was an honest ending where I ended the book, at least for our family, where Leah started doing better. And oh man, it was, it was so, it was so, I was so glad to be able to end on that. And it's meant a lot to my readers. And I talked to a lot of my readers who are in uh, our, sh my shoes or their, their family's shoes. And it's really helpful to, it's really helpful to be the person with hope. And so um, I'm, pr I'm pretty glad about that. I forgot to mention this at the beginning, Jeff, but to our audience, if anybody else has questions, please do not hesitate to post them in the chat and Jeff will be happy to entertain. Um, hey, I want to say something else about the ending and I alluded to it earlier, Joe. Um, and then I want to, you know what, you were asking me about voice, and I want to get back to that in a minute, but um, a couple things about that. Um, I, I, I had an epilogue written. Well, the book came out last July, and right up to the end, I was rewriting the epilogue because it changed from the earlier draft the pandemic happened, and I believe it was May 25th that George Floyd died. 
and Leah and I had lived three blocks from 38th in Chicago, and the first house we bought, that was our apartment, our first house was about seven blocks from 38th in Chicago. And I alluded in the narrative to the cops coming on our block at, uh, when we lived in our apartment near there. And then I alluded to the cops coming to our house um, during Leah's manic episodes. Um, it, it really felt urgent for me to talk about that in the epilogue and to reflect further on that ours was an experience of two white middle-class people. And we know for sure now that the way the Minneapolis police deal with mental illness, overall, they don't have a good track record. They particularly don't have a good track record of how they deal with mental illness um, uh, with non-whites. I had described them in our narrative the first time that they came to our house. I, you know, they, they were okay. I, I would say they were okay. Leah has different memories of those incidents that she and I talked about yesterday. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to give the Minneapolis cops a, a pass at all. Um, it's, I, I've heard of good things going on with the St. Paul police, including a friend of mine who was on the St. Paul police force who, who got um, crisis intervention training. And I know he did great stuff. So it's important to acknowledge just that, that angle on our experience and the greater issue of uh, how, how the justice system handles mental illness. So I had to say that as long as we're talking, that's in the epilogue, which was- Yeah, no, I, really I appreciate that. Um, so I'd, I have one related question about writing process, Jeff. You and I have spent many years as professional editors. Could you describe for our audience what it was like to be on the receiving end of oh. editorial feedback? And what was your <laughs> attitude generally getting feedback and how many people did you contact and, and how did that play out? Well, I love that question. Um, it's a gr I love that question. Uh, yes, I had been editing 30 years at that point. And, um, and I mean, I've been edited. I was a newspaper guy, so I got edited there. And when I used to write jokes in a column, I'd have 12 inches. If I had 15 inches of jokes, they'd have to cut three inches. I'd be like, ah, oh, man, there goes my jokes. And, you know, those, you hated that. But, you, you know, you got it. You have 12 inches. You knew what you had to fill. So um, I'm, I was used to it. Having said that, Joe, you get back some really good edits, especially from the substantive editors who's, who I wanted to tear it apart. I said to one of them, don't be nice. I'm the guy that you can, you can, you, here, here's your chance. Just be straight up with me. Just give it to me. Yeah. I'm a writer. I can take it. I'm an editor. Well, she, uh, <laughs> she did it all back. So, but it was great. I know enough to say, thank you. Thank you for cutting those 30,000 words that I didn't need, it's so much better now because of your edits. There's a question in the chat box uh, related to what you were discussing previously. Would that experience discourage you from calling the police if there was a quote next time? The problem with the mental health system is there is no system. So what we are left with is the cops coming out in an emergency. If somebody is a danger to themselves and others. In Hennepin County, we call COPE. Uh, and I can't remember what it is. It's the crisis intervention team at the county. If the county determines that it's an emergency requiring the police to come the answer is, in the face of having nothing else, if the person is a threat to herself or himself or others, 
it's what we got. So I guess my answer is a reluctant yes. Although in my case, I, we always hope that the person who's ill will be willing to go to the hospital for treatment. And that does happen. Jeff, this is my final question, and, and then we'll allow the audience to ask a few more if they are so inclined. What do you wish you knew then that you know now? There are some easy answers, like I wish I had known about NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. Now, it's an exaggeration to say they saved my life. I, I couldn't have done it without our support group. And I still go, it's been coming up on six years since the first time I went. And I'm a facilitator now. And I feel like I give back a lot. Um, we had a new guy the other night. And he was so fried. He never even got out of, oh man, the guy was in his truck. He was calling from his truck because whatever was going on in his house, he had to be calling from his truck. He never got a word out. He was really close to just breaking down sobbing. And he, um, he, never, he, he never said anything. That was similar to my first experience, which I describe in the book. And what a, what a blessing it's been to have a group of people who who get it. That's, that's, that's the way you say it, who get it. And what a blessing for people to have people who've been there and can help you put things in perspective and reassure you. And I try to be that guy now. So that's one thing. Um, what else have I learned? I, I mean, I learned so much about mental illness. You know, I'm a much more compassionate person now toward Leah, toward anybody with a mental illness. I'm smarter about it. Um, I'm, I'm just a more caring person in general. So whatever it is I've learned, I wish I had been more compact. I wish I'd been that compassionate and caring before our family, before our family went through this. Um, I learned that sometimes doctors are the best medicine. A good doctor is the best medicine. I'm so grateful for Leah's doctors. Um, I learned, <laughs> I learned there's good marriage therapists and there's bad ones. Uh, I what else did I learn? Um, I know that's a pretty good little laundry list right there. I don't know. I, there's probably more I, I'll, that I'll remember afterwards. I learned there's about nice self care. Listen, I learned about self care, and as I was going down, now the book's title is Unglued, and I it, the book's about me becoming unglued. And I, I, I was a wreck, I, a physical and mental wreck myself. And I didn't know how to take care of myself. I didn't know, I, I didn't understand what I was going through. I didn't understand self-care the way I do now. And especially in the beginning, I wish I had known better how to take care of myself when I was really going down the tubes. And I hope that my book is helpful that way. I think it is for other readers going through this about the importance of self-care and how to go about that. It's a lovely comment in the chat, Jeff. Your deep well of strength, compassion, and calm intelligence are an inspiration for all. And uh, and that's- Thank you, John. <laughs> hey, I, you know what, Joe? Do we have, are there more questions? No, I'd like to ask a few others. Uh, what, oh, what are you hearing anecdotally from readers uh, about your book and how it's, to use social science lingo again, affecting positive social change out there in the world? Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I know why you asked that. Um, Okay, so yeah, you know, I, I, my first graduate degree was in social work, and I had this idea about doing social change, social development. I really wanted to change the world. That's why I got an MSW. I think over time I learned, well, you're, if, maybe, but you're also just 
putting band-aids here and there was one thing I didn't like about social work. Um, so the kinds of fundamental change that we need related to mental illness are just overwhelming. There's been progress made, but like Sue Abderholden at NAMI says, there is no system. Um, so that is a lot for one guy named Jeff Zuckerman to tackle. But yes, I have talked to a lot of readers. It's like some of them are in my support groups and they, it was embarrassing the other night, like half of them had read my book and they're going on. Oh, Jeff. Oh, Jeff. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Well, this one guy in my group goes, this, he, he, who's in the book, he goes, yeah, book's not very good. <laughs> but then he was just yanking my chain. And, but that, they, they tell me about how it so captures their experience. It's affirming. It tells them you're not alone and you're not the problem here. The mental illness is the problem. And, and to emphasize, it's not our spouses and partners or family members or friends who are the problem. It's the mental illness. I started off the book by saying, I love, I have a love hate relationship with my wife's bipolar disorder. I love my wife, but I hate her, dis dis her bipolar disorder. And it's been helpful. I think my book presents illness, me mental illness that way. And I'd like to think that um, that's how people have read the book and come to see their own situations. And they too can become more compassionate amidst all the, the difficulty that we're going through. You mentioned earlier how much you had written and what you needed to chop. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What was left on the floor when you were done? Oh, yeah, I can. I uh, uh, Like I said, I think it's a, a, a good, I think they might have cut two, two really good substance, substantive, substantive editors. I think 35, 40,000 words. That's a lot of words. That's what is that? Three hundred. Uh, is that a hundred pages? Like a hundred pages of stuff. Well, a lot of it was. Uh, I uh, the easy answer is there's a lot of incidents. There were too many incidents, and that took up a big bulk of it. How many times do I have to say how? poorly I was behaving, how, how bad Leah's mental illness was affecting things and the, inc and the things that we went through. Funny thing about incidents is some guy, the guy in New Jersey who read it wrote me, oh man, the incidents. We had, we had like the hanger incident. We had the hubcap incident. It was something random like that. But those of us who go through us, it's an it's an incident. Then it becomes the incident with a capital I. So we all go. Well, there were too many incidents. There was there was too much stuff. There were some other things they changed. They took out some illustrations that I had that were taking up too much room, and they weren't very effective. Um, at a line edit, uh, the la my last reader, uh, Laura, did a good job of. She and Le Leah, but Laura really did a good job of just turning 10 words into nine or eight and sometimes finding just the exact word. No, I was pretty good at that. There's another question in the chat, Jeff. Have your children been changed and in what ways and what might they say? You know what I'm going to say. You'd have to ask my children. Uh, they, here's, what, here's, what, here's a good answer for them, for everybody, though. It has brought our family closer together. For sure, it has brought our children closer together. To have a calamity in your family that affects everyone, it almost sounds like a cliche, but it's not. My kids are old. They're in their 30s. Older. I didn't mean to say old. My kids are in their 30s. Um, and so they, you know, they're just naturally more mature and everything. But the relationship has matured, I think, in part of this, as part of this, because we've all, we've all had to handle a crisis together, a series of crises together. And we are way more honest and candid with each other about the things going on in our own lives. We're way more open. 
And I would hate to think that somebody needs to have a crisis like we went through to bring your kids closer together. Um, and it's probably not even what's going to happen for everybody, but that's how I can say that has happened in our family. Thanks, Jeff. You mentioned at the beginning you had some other excerpts you oh. may have wanted to share with us. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? I was There was one I was going to do, but just because I read this the, the other day at a um, – at a, a different reading that I did. And if we're, if this is the lead into the ending, I, you know what, you don't want to, you don't want to give away the ending in case anybody hasn't read it. But I think a lot of people are on the call have read it. And I got so much joy from reading the end. This is going up to the, up to the um, epilogue. I mean, the afterward that, um, that I, I can't read this enough. How's that sound? So I was going to read something else, but here, let's, if we're ending, let's end on this. Uh, let me, glass of water. People in our support group come and go. Some have been attending longer than I have. Some have disappeared. Some have gotten divorced. Some have hung on, and some, like me, offer words of hope. For ourselves and our loved ones. The mental illnesses change little. Agoraphobia, anxiety, PTSD, attachment disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, intermittent explosive disorder, schizoaffective disorder, severe anxiety, suicidal ideation, bipolar, bipolar, bipolar. In our group each month, we share our experiences and what we have learned, like what it actually means when people remind you to take care of yourself, like learning to forgive yourself without guilt for setting boundaries, learning about resilience and how to counterpunch the stigma of mental illness, learning to appreciate the power of friendship, humor, and hope, learning that although my life with Leah will continue to change, I'm better equipped to deal with it, learning that a caring doctor is the best medicine, that meds quit working but new treatments get developed, learning the best thing any of us can do is go to bed at night and ask ourselves if we were as loving as we could be that day. I learned it's okay to have a love-hate relationship with my wife's bipolar disorder. Her illness nearly destroyed our family, but love turned out to be the glue that held us together. And if, as my support group friend Jack Lemon says, these are all gifts, then I learn my cup runneth over. God might laugh at my plans, but for now, I might just be the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Well chosen. I'd like to invite Annie back in if she wouldn't mind, if she has any questions or final comments. No, I think we've, we've got through all the questions in uh, the chat. Thank you everyone for sending those in and for tuning in tonight. It's been great to have you. Thanks, Joe, for your wonderful interview um, and Jeff for that beautiful passage you just read and the earlier one. Um, as a reminder, the link to Unglued at majorsandquinn.com is in the comments as well. So if you want to head over to the Majors and Quinn website after this broadcast and check out the book, if you haven't looked into it yet, please do so. Um, and as a reminder, it is also on the shelves at Majors and Quinn. If you are here in the Twin Cities area, you can come in and look at it in person. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Thank you, Anna. You did a superb job of organizing in this. Behind oh, well, the thank you. Yes, Thanks well done, Anna. Um, and yeah, this video remains available on the Majors and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel for anyone who may have missed it this evening. You can send people uh, to our social media to find it. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Good night. Bye.